176 of Grayson Steel. I'm Kevin Steele. The JQ. It's a safe bet that almost everyone listening to this podcast knows what this means. For those that don't, it means the Jewish question. And it's a subject that bedevils the right. Given the great wealth, power, and influence of the Jews in the West, their attitude to us is of critical importance. Many on the right, particularly those on the alt-right, are convinced that the Jews are our enemies, as evidenced by the prevalence of many mocking, even hateful, memes to this effect on the internet. In turn, Jewish organizations have accused the alt-right of being a critical threat to Jewish interests. Notwithstanding, there are some Jews who are consciously identified with the alt-right. One of them is our guest on this podcast. He calls himself the Rebbe and claims that what is typically attacked as Jewish thought is not, in fact, Jewish at all. The Rebbe has made a study of millenarian Jewish leaders Sabbatai Zivai, 1626-1676, and Jacob Frank, 1726-1791, and has concluded that they are the founders of what could be described as anti-Judaism. Traditional Judaism, the Rebbe believes, is essentially conservative and therefore no threat to the West. Heretical Sabbatean Judaism is the real threat, both to the West and to the Jewish people themselves. He spoke last week to Kevin Michael Grace. Well, welcome to Grace and Steel. You are the Rebbe. You want to explain the meaning of that to our listeners? Well, it's a, uh, a, a rabbinical dynasty that you have common in uh, Orthodox Judaism. And the concept behind the Twitter page is to explore this idea that the left is really a direct rejection of uh, traditional Judaism, which means that the right, in other words, a, a, tr- a traditional strict Jewish viewpoint, would represent the right, if that makes sense. No, it... Uh... It does, but uh, doubtless you're aware that uh, it has been alleged that quite a few intellectual movements, including Randianism, Boasian uh, anthropology, and uh, psychiatry, are Jewish heresies. Yes, that's exactly what's going on, is that um, the the general theory of, of the left it was put forward by, by Hitler, and you have it in the Paleocon right, is that the left came from the Frankfurt School, that you had an intellectual movement with Freud in South Germany around the turn of the century. And this evolved with Boaz, and it became the basis of the contemporary left. And I, I thought it was shocking because that would mean if the West falls, then the, the killer, the murder of the left cultural Marxism arose from these few people. So it you necessarily want to study them to find out exactly who killed you. And uh, I started to look into it, and the narrative just didn't make any sense for a variety of reasons. I, have a, I studied uh, history of philosophy and science in college and ne- neurobiology. It just didn't make sense that a couple of wacky Jews, including a cokehead, Sigmund Freud, figured out how to topple Western civilization and took it out in 90 years. It's just superhuman. It just didn't happen. That's not how it happened. There must be some kind of precedent prior to Freud and uh, cultural Marxism in the Frankfurt School where they got their ideas. Just the human brain doesn't, is not that creative. The comment I made is Freud would have to be superhuman. In fact, Freud isn't superhuman at all. He's not terribly bright. He just took pre-existing Jewish heresies and ideas and made them pseudoscience. So his ideas just were traced back to Sabbatai Zivi and Jacob Frank, just he put it into a, a clinical scientific format. Well, I'll interrupt you here, and perhaps you could give us a little potted description of the Jewish millenarianism uh, expressed by Zivi and Frank. Yes, well, uh, around 1666, Zivi came out, and he was the Messiah we were all waiting for, supposedly. And he, his philosophy, it's complex, it's based on the uh, Kabbalah. And 
it is essentially that what is holy is unholy, and what is unholy is holy. So from a technical Jewish theological standpoint, that means that the 613 uh, uh, commandments that we are supposed to follow, guess what? You don't have to follow them anymore. You're free. And not only that, you can do the opposite. So you can eat when you're supposed to fast. You can have sex with your neighbor's wife. You can be gay. You can have sex with little children. You can do everything. And what was terrifying about this movement and it presaged the decline of Western civilization and the problems to come was the resonance. His spokesman, Nathan of Gaza, deployed the printing press, which was a novel technology at the time. And he sent these flyers to all the synagogues across Europe. And the result was extraordinary. It's possible up to a million Jews joined this insane movement. And this was deeply embarrassing for Jewry. And then he was uh, refuted and eventually uh, his ideas were buried. And he was forced to uh, convert to Islam. But the movement didn't die. It just went underground. So you ended up with this stealth Sabbatean movement that lingered on. And it actually formed the, Ju the Jewish uh, Enlightenment in the uh, 18th century. So Zevi was staggeringly influential in Jewish thought, even though he was a false messiah. And then uh, he came back from the dead, so to speak. He was claimed to be reincarnated by a guy named Jacob Frank in the late 18th century. So it's about the 1770s. So he's just like Zevi, but he's more perverse. And he's, ha he's holding ritualistic orgies, you name it. And they're doing uh, pedophilia. It's extremely bizarre. He's having an affair with his daughter. And his bodyguards are, are women. He's a, a strong feminist. And he's actually Zionist as well, which is something that is, must be extremely confusing. So some of the Zionist ideas came from Jacob Frank. And this is because early Zionism was viewed as a heresy in Jewish thought because it contradicted in, uh, it depends on your, your interpretation. But some rabbis believe the Messiah had to come first before he went back to Israel. So Zionism circa 1800 was a largely viewed as a uh, as a uh, heresy. Well, I'll just interrupt to say that uh, I, I suppose most listeners wouldn't understand that uh, Zionism was a very controversial notion uh, amongst uh, diaspora uh, Jews uh, for the longest time. Now it's just assumed that every Jew exactly. is a Zionist, but there were these tremendous intellectual battles in America, for instance, for decades over this. Oh, yeah. So so what happened with uh, with Frank is he was countered by a guy named Rabbi Emden, who was this nemesis. He was a, a traditional Jew, and he hated the Sabbateans. And he warned the Europeans that the Sabbateans, Sabbateans including Jacob Frank, quote, wanted to destroy the world. Which, of course, at the time sounded insane, but in 2017, it, it doesn't sound insane. It sounds actually dead-on accurate. So the, the Sabbateans, in the form of Jacob Frank, lost again. They were defeated, and they went underground. And the story continues where they it's, it's rumored that the Rothschilds were uh, Frankists, and it, it's very possible. So they moved into finance and became extremely successful. And a lot of people harp on this and say that the Rothschilds, this, I don't really think that's the essence of the problem. I think it's actually much worse. What they did in 1848, there were all these uh, revolts across Europe. And what they did is they penetrated the uh, uh, medical profession in the, in, in the uh, Austrian empire. Now, the Austrians, of course, wanting to use science in the name of progress, didn't regulate the medical profession. This was a terrible, terrible mistake because what happened is the medical profession just became a uh, cabal of these Frankists and they helped start the uh, revolt of 1848, which in many ways resembles the current situation with uh, cultural Marxism because this is pre-communism. It's kind of a, in, the, in the same way that the modern left isn't communist, the revolt of 1848 was this, it was more of a cultural left if that makes sense. Well, I, I just, uh, I was going to mention uh, the, the famous uh, Dr. Uh, Semmelweis, who discovered the, uh, discovered purple fever 
was a Jew, and he was famously uh, ruined and died in an insane asylum uh, due to uh, anti-Semitism. So this, I'm a little confused as uh, talking about uh, Jewish influence in the medical profession. I mean, he, he was famously from Vienna, and anti-Semitism was sufficient. I mean, he, when uh, he, he simply got the people involved in childbirth to wash their hands, and uh, the deaths of newborns plummeted, uh, but there was uh, jealousy, and oh, he didn't have a theory for this. So as I say, uh, he was uh, famously ruined in one of the great disgraces of medical history. When did, when did that happen? Uh, well, let's see. He died in uh, 1865. So this happened in 1848. Yeah, he made, so, he made his discovery the, uh, he, uh, regarding purple fever uh, in 1847. Th- this is the, the core issue, is that the, uh, the Hungarian Empire, uh, the um, Austrians, unfortunately left an area where they could be attacked. And this helped allow this subversive movement to, to, to grow. And the fact that this guy's making a discovery, it's difficult because you have to control progress, but in the same way, the Frankists are exploiting it. Now, I wanted to ask you at this point, this question, this thorny question of what is a Jew. Now, uh, Rabbi Jacob uh, Neusner, uh, he was uh, at one time the religion editor of Chronicles magazine, and he said, well, there's no question to me what a, a Jew is. A, a Jew is someone who follows the Jewish religion. Now, it strikes me, correct me if you think I'm wrong, that this is a minority position now, that Judaism, especially in the, well, in the diaspora, is seen as more of an ethnic thing than uh, a religious thing. Well, well, sure, because if you're in a, a Frankist paradigm where you no longer have to follow the 613, where you are actually rejecting Jewish law, then you're going to have to change the definition of Judaism so you don't have to follow these rules. So the, the result is that you have Reformed Judaism, which it has the rituals of Judaism. It sounds like Judaism. They do all the ceremony. But the underlying beliefs are actually Frankist. They're a, a rejection of Judaism in, in its uh, traditional form. When you look at the United States, uh, what percentage of Jews are Orthodox Jews? It's about 15% uh, percent or so. Now, this is, this is one of those things that I've been working on the last couple of weeks to try to explain why every other country is 50% percent Orthodox but the United States is about 15%. Well, the percentage words, of Orthodox Jews in Canada is uh, very low as well. It, it is a strange... I, I don't really know why. I do have a theory that it's possible that the um, immigration of Jews done in the United States was specifically done uh, to bring in more liberal Jews to be radicals. In, in, uh, so what happened actually in, in 1848, for example, is you, you had these Frankists who did this horrible uh, rebellion in the middle of Europe. And then when they lost, they ran to the United States. So in other words, the left has been benefiting from foreign radicals for about 160 years in the United States. This is when it really first started. And these radicals actually helped agitate for the Civil War. And they profited from it. So you have a, um, a situation where the, the left in the United States is specifically pulling in radicals from Europe. And the biggest proponents of uh, immigration, this is something that, Ke- that, uh, that uh, Kevin McDonald makes a uh, major topic of, are, are Jewish. But if you look at Zangwill, who is the major proponent of this, he came up with the phrase, the melting pot. That'd be Isra- is- Isra- Israel Zangwill? Yes, he came up with the phrase, melting pot. And I was watching Kevin do his, his description of, of it. And I realized when I'm listening to him that his melting plot play was a, actually a recreation of a scene from the Zohar where all different groups meld into one. So he's making this play that is really a bizarre play on, on Jewish uh, theology. The, the people who saw it had no idea. In fact, Roosevelt clapped at it. He was, he, he was extremely supportive. He said, that's one great play. Obviously, he had no idea the actual meaning of the play. 
And the idea of Zangwill, who was actually a Sabbatean, he wrote books like Freud about sexual depravity, was to, to use the United States as this, uh, to bring people from, from all over the planet to create this bizarre new far left United States identity. So the problem is that Roosevelt didn't understand that Zangwill was a complete subversive and he fell for the propaganda as did the United States. So we imported all of these Jews from Russia and for whatever reason, we got our mix of Jews was highly left wing. I think this was possibly done on purpose because the, the, the population of Jews in Queens and Brooklyn was, was so far left wing in, in the 1910s and 20s. In fact, the United States almost was toppled as a communist state in the 30s. Now, you mentioned the Zohar, which is part of the uh, Kabbalah. Yes. Now, I, the uh, Zivai and uh, the, the Frankists are associated with uh, the Kabbalah, but I'm just wondering, I had always assumed that the Kabbalah was a minority interest uh, uh, among Jews, but I wondered to what extent Jews could be said to be influenced by it secondhand. Well... You have different segments of it use it. For example, the uh, Hasidic Jews use it, and uh, Zivi used it, and the, and the Frankist. And it, there is one interesting concept, is Freud's idea, ideas, for example, the conscious and the subconscious may have been taken from the uh, Kabbalah. So what's going on is the, 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 these Frankist ideas, they're not merely inspiring Jewish intellectuals to be uh, depraved. But they're also giving them the um, intellectual paradigms and the ideas. Okay, when so, you when you hear a, a great many Jews, particularly liberal left wing Jews, will refer to the Tikkun Olam, the the repair of the world. That they, what does Judaism mean? They will say this. What what do you make of that description? Well, what happened in uh, Reform Judaism, and this, this isn't really a, a Jewish, there is a Tikkun Olam in Judaism to a degree. Judaism is mildly a uh, universal. You're actually supposed to be a light of the world. You're supposed to help different groups actually to become virtuous. So the idea that Tikkun Olam would be some kind of left-wing cause is absurd. But because Reform Judaism rejects uh, the traditional 613, they have to develop their own counter-theology. So Tikkun Olam is really a, a subversive element in Judaism where they're using it to mean whatever is the fashionable left-wing cause. So I guess it means Muslims coming in now. Five years ago, it could have meant global warming because that was more fashionable. Well, I, ju I just say at this point that I think that this repetition of the phrase the Tikkun Olam is one of the things that incites anti-Semitism because it, because in that is this claim of moral superiority. We know what's better for you, not just for our own people, but for every people, everyone in the United States and in the world, as it were. Well, it's really, I described it in a Twitter page uh, as a, a weaponized Judaism. Really, you're, you're taking Judaism and the, the culture of it, you're throwing it all out the window, all of the, the rules, and you're replacing it with this. And one of the, the issues from, from a, a traditional Jewish standpoint is, and one of the reasons I'm doing this, is we actually hate Frankists. They piss off Gentiles. They invoke hatred. They likely cause the Holocaust. And this is one of my issues with Kevin uh, McDonald's analysis is, in fact, Jewish interest is staying quiet, not meddling in society, not trying to organize revolts to subvert it, not trying to change it. In fact, in Jewish theology, you're supposed to follow the law of the king. You're not supposed to, to uh, try to change it in this way. So really what the Frankists are doing is an absolute rejection of uh, traditional Judaism in that now they've made Judaism as the opposite of its, you know, the thing of the quiet Jew in, in the ghetto. Now it's the Jew who can't shut up and just constantly intervenes with politics, constantly meddling. And that this is the Frankist viewpoint is they're always... Uh, it's, this is the, their intellectual paradigm, is they're always interfering with society, doing the exact opposite of the uh, traditional Jewish role. Now, I wanted to ask you about the importance of the Holocaust in Jewish thinking. It's my own view that uh, among his many, many uh, grave sins, uh, one of the gravest of Hitler's was that uh, he, he weaponized uh, the Jews 
against Western civilization. I'm reminded of something that uh, Korngold, uh, the great Jewish composer uh, who's most exactly. famous yeah. uh, for his movie scores in America, that he said that uh, we never thought of ourselves as uh, Jews before Hitler in Austria. We thought of ourselves as Austrian and that uh, Hitler turned us into Jews, as it were. And of course, um, you know, Jews were a very bad thing to Hitler. Uh, it just, I look at this overweening importance of the Holocaust, it seems to me, in the Jewish consciousness. And I thought that you could perhaps look at Judaism before the Holocaust. And Jews thought, we are special because God loves us so. And post-Holocaust, a great many Jews have seemed to evolve to a position that we are special because God hates us so. Uh, there, there's always, a, 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 in Judaism, there's, all, there's, a, there's a, a theme that we are a persecuted people. And that we have to, have to stick together. And this is, in, in fact, part of the reason in traditional Judaism, why you, you don't want to mess with your ruler and your country. You, you're not supposed to do that, specifically to avoid... The, the wrath of the uh, uh, local people. But what the Holocaust is, is obviously Hitler was right wing. And as I'm describing, the, the movement in Frankism is far left. So by saying Hitler is the worst of the worst, what you've done is you've weaponized Jews as a far left wing group. And in Reform Judaism, again, they don't have a theology because they reject Jewish law. So what do they have? They have Tikkun Olam, which is a left wing cause. And they have the Holocaust, which now they can rationalize that these right-wingers are terrible. But a, a part of the problem, and in this way, I, I think that Kevin's right, is that now you've got Jews who are neurotic. You're now terrified that if something goes wrong, one day those Gentiles are going to kill you again. They're going to throw you into ovens. In fact, on Twitter, I saw this a couple of days ago among right-wing Jews expressing concern that this is going to happen again. And even among Jews who support Trump, and Trump got very strong uh, support among, uh, uh, among, among uh, Orthodox Jews, they're, they're even scared of it. So what that does is it creates an unfortunate um, desire where you don't want white power to be strong because you're worried about being killed again. So, this, so Hitler well, actually... Well, I, I was going to mention in that respect that uh, Barbara Emile... Conrad Black's wife, uh, who was, uh, well, largely raised in Canada from a, a teenager and is now back in London where she was born, she made this extraordinary statement, uh, I don't know, a, a decade, 10, 15 years ago, that she always keeps her Gucci suitcases packed. Uh, and I'm thinking, is she expecting the Cossacks uh, to, to come roaring down the streets of Knightsbridge? It just seemed an extraordinary thing to say. Yeah, th this is common, unfortunately. And it's thanks to Hitler and this whole issue being played. And my personal view is it was a bit of a black swan event that won't happen again in the West. My family, were they were uh, German Jews, and they came to the States in the 1850s or so. And we, prior to Hitler, we wanted to be wasps. My father and grandparents were raised like uh, English country gentlemen. They were into horseback riding and fencing. So prior to Hitler, you wanted to assimilate to Gentile society. And Hitler basically poured acid on that and created a situation where Jews, were, Jews aren't that way. Now they're much more uh, suspicious. So th this is uh, potentially toxic. But at this stage of the game, however, Jews... It's becoming absurd because Islam represents so much more of a threat than do Gentiles. The, the idea that there's going to be a second Holocaust from Gentiles seems a bit far-fetched. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I wanted to ask you first, uh, you're familiar with Raoul Hilberg? No. Uh, he wrote The Destruction of the European Jews, which is, I suppose, the, the definitive uh, study of the Holocaust. He was a very uh, conservative man, lifelong Republican. But in the last years of his life, he came to despair about the condition of Jews in the United States. He, he was asked 
what he thought the future of the Jews was, and he thought that it was likely to be assimilation or expulsion. And that rather took me back, because as I say, uh, Hilberg was a uh, very patriotic, uh, a, a right winger, and yet uh, he came to this despair. How common do you think that is? Jews, there is a strain of neuroticism. It's more common, oddly enough, among secular Jews. Religious Jews don't worry about it. And the actual fate of Jews in the United States is, seems fairly obvious. Uh, the, the birth rate among secular Jews is plummeting. It's skyrocketing among uh, religious Jews. So likely within one to two generations, Jews will be more Jared Kushner than the typical left-wing commentator. And it's un I don't believe there's any chance of an expulsion. for If you look at uh, Trump, his children are Jewish. But it doesn't make any difference. Uh, part of the suspicion, I suspect, the uh, neuroticism, is a bit of envy of uh, Gentiles. I, I don't really understand the the uh, uh, psychology of it, but the, the future of Jewry is is likely in the United States is likely fairly positive, simply because of the birth rates. It's like Kuhn, the the way that ideas change is the old liberal Jews are going to die off, and young conservative Jews are being born. In New York City, about fifty percent of the Jews are uh, Orthodox, so so that's the future. The, the Jews under under eighteen. I'll just mention with regard to Raoul Hilberg. Um... He considered himself an atheist, but after his second wife, uh, I'm reading from Wikipedia, 12 years into their marriage, converted from Episcopalianism to Judaism in 1993, Hilberg began quietly to attend services at a conservative synagogue in Burlington. But uh, there's a very interesting thing that's happening. Uh, you know, you have uh, people, I'm trying to remember the name, he was a uh, well-known Jewish uh, political figure. He was in the uh, Bush White House. He may be part of the, through marriage, through the Podhoretz clan. That you have a great many Jews um, railing against intermarriage, but the intermarriage continues apace. And you, now you have this phenomenon of not just half Jews, you know, Mischlings, but quarter Jews, one-eighth Jews. And do you think that these people who are by blood one-quarter uh, one-eighth Jews who are not Jewish by matrilineal standards will continue to regard themselves as Jews? That's, I'd say they don't, it depends if, if they have a different faith. For example, if you have a J Jewish grandfather and you were raised Catholic, you're not going to regard yourself as Jewish, but you might be more sympathetic to Jews. But yes, this is the future. And Part of the problem in the United States with Jewry is that uh, young women are extremely far left wing. About 90% of young Jewish women voted for uh, Hillary, single women, while among married Jewish men, it was 58%. So there's a staggering schism. No, I've noticed that myself. You know, it's, you, it's I, I, re I read a piece and if it's by a Jewish man, I think, well, you know, he could go one way or the other. But if it's a Jewish woman, I know pretty much from the beginning what this woman's going to say. Almost, and I'm almost always right. So what this means from a practical standpoint, and I have experienced this myself, is it's extremely difficult to find a Jewish wife. The, these women have just bought feminism uh, hook, line, and sinker. And it's been devastating for uh, Judaism. This is something that people think, oh, well, feminism is in the Jewish interest. And if you're a single Jewish male, it certainly is not, because these women are impossible. At college campuses, it's, I, I hear Jewish men complaining constantly about how hard it is to find a Jewish girl. So the result is that these secular Jewish women who are far left are just not going to have babies. So this problem of left-wing Jewry will resolve itself within a few generations, simply because these girls are not going to be having children. Now, let's talk about the alt-right, because you've identified yourself with the alt-right, correct? Yes. This fellow, Ezra Levant, uh, who I've had battles with in the past, I have it on, and he runs this site, uh, The Rebel, uh, which has a considerable American fan base. I have it on very good authority 
that he has said that he doesn't even consider himself a conservative, because, and he calls himself a classical liberal, which I just consider to be a dodge, because, I don't know, after Hayek, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But uh, apparently he expressed the opinion that the conservatives would always be anti-Semitic. Sure. The, here's here's the issue. Obviously, if one one of the ironies of the Frankists is that they want you to hate Jews. So, for example, Jacob Frank spread the blood libel that Jews make matzah out of baby Christians, and this this is extremely. This doesn't really make any sense. Why would a Jew make Christians hate Jews? And it seems when you read these these articles by Jews, it seems like that's what they want. It's almost like a, a masochistic approach. So it's reasonable to think that, yeah, sure, conservatives will always hate Jews. But the, the bizarre thing about it is that the left kind of wants this. Jacob Frank was specifically pushing it. And part of the reason is to isolate conservative Jews. The way that Jacob Frank lost in the end was that conservative Jews and Catholics got together against him and they shut him down. So if you can silence conservative Jews then conservative Christians aren't going to know what the hell is going on. They're going to see these crazy Jews doing all of these things, and they're, they're not really going to know how to tackle it. If you understand that the movement comes from a certain element of Jewry, you at least you have a handle on it and you're not shooting in the dark. So since most conservatives aren't going to see the, the subtlety of this argument, they're actually going to take a, a default position that you know it's, it's the fault of Jews. So his concern is probably justified on some level. Well, you know, this phrase blood libel, you know, it turns out there are many such blood libels, apparently. Most recently, this was a surprise to me, perhaps it shouldn't have been, that in this discussions of the grandfather of Canada's foreign minister, uh, Christia Freeland, who be was a Nazi collaborator during the Second World War, it was put about that uh, this idea that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union uh, in well, in the early days, of the early decades, uh, was uh, heavily Jewish. Well, this was a blood libel. Now, as to the ethnic uh, composition of the leaders of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and of the leaders of the NKVD, the uh, secret police, these are historical facts. And yet now I see it's described as a blood libel. Yes, uh, they, they, obviously there were lots of Jews involved in, in the Soviet Union when it started. And the, part of the reason for this was because there were lots of Jews in these cities. So Kiev was about 50 odd percent Jewish. So you're pulling people from the city, they're, they're going to be Jewish. That's one factor. But the other factor is obviously this was a, a Jewish movement. And what it was similar to was how the Raj in, in uh, India, the, the uh, British uh, Raj, used Sikhs. They, the way that the communists took over the Soviet Union partially was to just pull all the Jews in, hope they would be loyal, and use that as a, a cadre to, uh, to push it. But th this is all unfortunately true. It's a dark chapter in Jewry. And it obviously, it likely uh, provoked the, uh, the uh, uh, Holocaust. For the, the, the Jewish involvement in this was, was terrible. And this is exactly what uh, traditional Judaism doesn't want to do. And the uh, communists per se were uh, heavily influenced by Frankist thought. When they first came to power, the first thing they did was they abolished all moral standards. So were they really communist or were they really Frankist? It's, it's not entirely clear. Now, this question of whether Jews are white, now I've always just assumed that Jews are white, but uh, as you probably know, there's a big discussion of this in white nationalist circles. I don't consider myself a white nationalist, and I don't, quite honestly, I don't really know what that means. But increasingly you see Jews, uh, especially in the media, who go out of their way to attack white people, and the assumption is, well, we're not white. Uh, what do you make of this? Obviously, they're trying to establish themselves as the um, <clears throat> ally of, let's say, uh, blacks and Muslims. And this has been something that the Jewish left has been doing for uh, decades, kind of a top bottom. But, uh, you know, if you're 
In real life, what do I think Jews are? If you uh, put a gun to my head, I'd say they're a lot like uh, Greeks or maybe Armenians. They are somewhat European and somewhat Eastern. In, in real life, that's what they act like. Or even uh, Sicilian, where they're, it's a, a kind of like an East-West uh, hybrid. And you're part Jewish and you're part uh, European. But the right now at this point, what's going on, one of the multiple uh, vectors of attack against Western Civ is instead of saying, hey, we, we want to destroy Western civilization and we want to destroy all civic order, they're instead saying we want to attack whites. It's just a, a, a politically correct way of saying that. So if you're left wing, it's now a race war versus whites. And it's one of the reasons why I'm a bit tolerant of white nationalism. Because I recognize what's going on is there's a deliberate attack vector to destroy Western civilization through a race war versus whites. And the problem with this is that Christianity doesn't necessarily have white identity baked into it. And the United States doesn't have it. So there's no intellectual paradigm to counter multiculturalism. You really have to go back to the Hebrew scriptures where you have Tower of Babel. There are some nationalist concepts there, but... Unfortunately, it looks as if white nationalism, which seems a bit odd, is a, a good vehicle to fight multiculturalism, which appears to be the weapon of choice to destroy Western civilization at this point. Well, it seems fairly obvious to me that Jews defining themselves as not white is not good for the Jews because this question of white privilege, well, if we make the Jews a separate group from whites, then the question of their uh, disproportionate, uh, as far as I'm concerned, mostly earned influence in finance, academia, Hollywood, etc., this is going to come to the fore. And that, that Jews are going to be tacked specifically uh, for their privilege instead of being you know, lumped in with uh, all the other whites. Well, I think it's a, it's a Jewish narcissistic fantasy that we are victims when we, we aren't. We have advantages, extraordinary advantages in our families, in our uh, wealth. And it's, it's just this idea that don't, don't hate us. We're really down with the black man and we're, we're not really part of them. So there, this is, this is a big, a, a bit of a paradigm shift because people tend to think of Jews as this far left group and it's Jews versus whites. But if you take a different perspective from a Jewish conservative, it's actually the left versus Judaism. And the left has taken over secular Jewry in the way that it's, let's say, blacks have been taken over by the uh, left. And uh, particularly young Jewish females have been utterly taken over by the, uh, the left. So from a rhetorical standpoint of Jews aren't white, what it does is it allows Jews to think that they're not associated with, with Western civilization or white civilization and to kind of join the crowd of these uh, ethnic groups who are really trying to take over the country. So it's a, a subversive idea of the left, again, trying to split Jewry from joining up with uh, Christianity in kind of a unified front versus the far left. Now, the alt-right or certain elements in the alt-right uh, take uh, great pleasure in uh, using the so-called uh, happy uh, merchant mem uh, ovens, uh, such like, now, you know, I'm an old man, and uh, this strikes me as being, at the very least, uh, grossly insensitive, but clearly that's the point. I, I mean, you know, I can say with all honesty, there's, there's no question that there is an extraordinary anti-Jewish animus uh, on the alt-right. How, how much does that bother you? Well, the, the problem with it is that if you take Kevin McDonald's argument seriously, and the alt-right does, then what you're left with is a causes belli against Jews. Because he makes it clear that it is in the Jewish interest to destroy Western civilization. And another guy, E. Michael Thomas, he says that Jewish theology is against logos, and therefore we constantly want to destroy Western civilization. Now, these two things, as, as I, I can expand upon it, are incorrect. 
So they're misguided, unfortunately. And obviously, I don't like it. From an intellectual standpoint, they're wrong. But here's one of the, one of the elements. I mean, it, this is a sad truth. But if you're, how are you going to get red pilled from a realistic standpoint? If you're a normal white guy, and if I tried to explain to you uh, that, uh, you know, the re- reality is it was a Jewish heresy that inspired Freud and Marx and uh, Bolsheviks, and this has been attacking your civilization, you have to fight it. They're not going to believe that. But if they first believe that Jews are a problem, and then I say, well, yes, Jews are a problem, and specifically it's associated with Frankism, and that's the specific condition, and a vast bulk of Jewry opposes them, that's not a hard move to make. So in a certain sense, the anti-Semitism wakes up the population to the fact that a lot of their um, elites hate them. So it's well, well, you know, Donald Trump is obviously the most uh, philosemitic president in the history of the United States, Absolutely, yeah. and yet the Jewish opposition to him is even more hysterical than it was against Pat Buchanan. But th- this proves my point. That in fact, what the Jewish left pushes is actually anti-Jewish. A traditional Jewish viewpoint is a uh, survival strategy. Kevin, Kevin McDonald is correct to a degree that uh, traditional Judaism is based upon how to survive and thrive among Gentiles and not get yourself killed. And if Frankism and the contemporary left is the opposite of traditional Judaism, then it's a suicide pact. So they're going to do things hostile to Jewish interest. So, of course, any Jew with half a brain is going to vote for Donald Trump. And among Orthodox Jews, he's pulling 60-70%, despite the alt-right, his associations with, with the alt-right. So, it, it doesn't make any sense. And if, you're, if you haven't thought through these issues, as I have, it's going to be incredibly confusing. But when you view Jew, um, the Jewish left as a hostile element to Jewry and to Western civilization in general, then things start to make sense. Well... How many Jews would you say in the United States uh, share positions that are similar to yours? I know that Orthodox Jews, a a large portion of them do. But aside from that, there are a few seculars, but not many. If you go to Israel, sure, there are are fair numbers. Or if you go outside the United States, I get a fair amount of support. But generally, it's it's a small group. Will it increase over time? Of course, because of the uh, demographic changes that I was discussing, Orthodox Jews, from their perspective, they understand that the left is, they're a bunch of Jewish heretics. And that's why it, it's actually extremely strange. The uh, um, Orthodox Jews vote about 65% for the Republicans. So they vote like far-right conservatives, like uh, far-right Christians. And what's strange about that is there is no other group on planet Earth, aside from far-right Christians, who vote like that. They're a, a uniquely, oddly, it's a uniquely pro-Western group of people. Well, I've spoken to uh, Paul Gottfried many times, and yes. I asked him once, and with regard to the immigration question, when are Jewish leaders going to smarten up? And he told me, never. Are you that pessimistic? Uh, yeah, that's that's about right. Now, what what will happen is that uh, you have varying birth rates. The Jewish liberals are going to die off, and the Jewish conservatives have lots of babies. And this is not just in Jewry. This is Mormons. The, the future of the country are uh, religious people, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. So, no, I, I don't think they're going to change. It's just, um, I actually want to say that. Uh, you know, there there are some changes going on. For example, Israel is shifting so far right nowadays. That country is has done an extraordinary job of uh, defeating its left. And it, it offers a lot of hope for the United States. And one of my messages is that we should copy them and figure out what they did to beat their, their own internal left. So if Israel continues to pull to the far right, it's going to have a gravitational pull on Jewry in the United States. Well, they polarized uh, Netanyahu uh, and his allies, polarized the electorate. The reason that the Labor Party was in power uh, to the late 1990s was because the Arabs voted overwhelmingly for the Labor Party. Yes. But I see with Netanyahu, he seems to be making a very considerable effort to ally himself with the American right. And this is something that 
I, I've looked for for decades. It it hasn't come off. That the that the Jews and the conservatives they they make an alliance, and it would work something like this: that um, as far as uh, settlements go, the West Bank, you do what you will. We're not going to interfere, and in return, uh, you give us your support for the idea that we are allowed to have our own homelands. Uh, this is a huge misconception that there's any kind of grand bar bargain. Israeli Jews just don't even think about them as Jews. Think of them as an entirely different group of people. There's been a schism. They run in their, their own situation. Their views, they are far-right Jews. So in other words, Jews in the United States who were conservative went there to, to a certain degree. And there's the policies of Israel, how Israel doesn't support Muslims coming into their country and how Jews don't. It's because they're two entirely different groups of people. There's no real common sense. There's no unity. There's well, no, no I, I mean, Netanyahu, I, he says he said some very good things. But I'm thinking of diaspora Jews. If you look at the situation on university campuses in Britain, Canada, the United States. I mean, my joke has been for years, and it's no longer really a joke, that the question on the right has been, how much do you love Israel? And the question on the left has been, how much do you hate Israel? And with that in mind, I was thinking that diaspora Jews would be willing uh, to trade support for, you know, Sweden for the Swedes, you know, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, uh, in, in, ex in exchange for, you know, a support of Israel, because I think you may disagree that Israel is quickly becoming, if it hasn't already become, the new South Africa. The problem is that Jews in the diaspora, Jewish leftists, don't really care much about uh, Israel. And, and they don't make, certainly don't have the intellectual uh, wherewithal to realize that Israel blocks people is... You know, he's definitely a far right country and that, um, and that the policy is different in the United States. And there's some kind of a contradiction that's just not on their radar screen. I've actually mentioned it to several left wing Jews in, in the press and it just doesn't, I don't know how else to describe it. It just doesn't ping on their radar. They don't really make that uh, connection. Or if they do, they start to oppose Israel. So what you're seeing now in the United States is a movement where the U.S. left, leftist Jewry, is going against Israel. Oh, yeah, and, and I know the reason for that. It's because multiculturalism is their highest value, and Israel is explicitly not a multicultural country. It's a Jewish homeland. It's not just that. Uh, Israel is a right-wing, anti-Francist country. So the, the multiculturalism is the uh, tip of the iceberg. They, are, they have a, a court system run by rabbis. This is far different than the United States. They have military service. Just on, on, on every single issue of the left, Israel is this far-right ideal. Now, w with regard to immigration policy, Britain, Canada, the United States, France, filling up with Muslims, many of whom would gladly slit every Jewish throat they could get their hands on, and yet Almost all the Jewish leaders uh, support the immigration of Muslims, even after the events, the recent events in France. And this seems, it seems so perverse as to be uh, barely imaginable. Yes, well, there, there's several reasons behind it. One, I there were some rabbis in Europe who spoke up against this. And what happened to them is they got attacked. Their homes were attacked. Their um, offices were attacked. The Jews of Europe understand that if they speak out against Islam, they're going to get killed. And the security that they're offered isn't sufficient. So they're going to put their heads in the line. Now, these groups, these Jewish groups that push, that push this, are not terribly powerful and not terribly uh, significant in the grand scope. But they're among the left-wing Jews of Europe, they're just naive. They, they don't get it. Now, and many of them just leave. If they oppose um, immigration, what they do is they just go to Israel. 
they don't say anything. Because from an Orthodox Jewish standpoint, if you start getting involved with politics, you're going to get yourself in trouble. They, they don't like doing that. So they just pack up and leave. Well, yeah, that comes up in uh, Welbeck's novel, Submission, where he's talking with this old Jewish girlfriend uh, of his. And she says, well, you know, things are getting hot here, so we'll move to Israel. And then, you know, the protagonist says something like, lucky for you. You know, in other words, you have a homeland. Apparently, we don't. I, I followed several of the rabbis in Belgium and Holland and the chief rabbis, and they've been attacked by terrorists. And I, I have a Judar, so to speak. I can tell these are conservative people, and they hate the Islamic invasion. But they, in fact, in the early 80s, they used to fight it. Jews, to a degree, uh, join up with the, the far right-wing groups in Belgium. But at the end of the day, you know, they know that they have a crosshairs on their head. If they speak out against it, they're going to get attacked, and they have been. So we can't really rely on European Jewry to speak out against this in a, in a large public forum because they're just going to get blown up. One last thing about Israel. I mean, I've been a lifelong Zionist. As far as I'm concerned, Israel should have annexed the West Bank in 1967 and expelled the Arabs. Uh, but I understand that other people have different opinions. And ultimately, I, it, it's not my country. They're, they're not my people. This idea that everyone has to choose a side between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the extent to which this has become a major issue in the United States and now in the last decade in Canada, I think that it may lead to a situation where the Jews get lumped in with the, with the Arabs as fractious ethnics and that people in the West might decide a pox on both your houses. Do you think this is a possibility? No, I, I don't, uh, thankfully. Because what Jews ha have done to a certain degree, you, you, you know, as, as far as mentioning what Jews have done for Europe, well, they've actually done a great deal. Although Jews don't speak out uh, directly, Gert Wilders is a Jewish uh, creation. He spent several years in uh, Israel. So what they're doing, what Jews are doing is they're using proxies to speak for them. Because if we actively speak out against Islam, we're going to get blown up. So Trump, for example, is similarly surrounded by Jews. Gert Wilders, surrounded by Jews. So th this is an effective way that we can fight Islam and not get our synagogues blown up. And by doing this, we also build a, a measure of good faith. Gert Wilders and Trump both speak out in uh, support of uh, Israel and, and uh, Jewry in general. So I'm one of those optimistic people who think that it, that things with Jews and Christians are going to pan out okay. My, my big problem is I just don't think that uh, you, several European countries might not react in time to the peril and they could eventually become Islamic states in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Yes, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's traditional to say that the that the Germans uh, were so uh, broken by the first and then the Second World War and by you know the loss of roughly a third of their territory that this this is the reason for their weakness. But Sweden famously stayed out of both world wars, and they are, if anything, crazier uh, than the Germans are. So I I don't know. I I mean it, I, I just keep thinking. You know, that when people are determined to kill you, at some point you have to fight back. But I, we're watching this great experiment, aren't we? As yes. To, well, as to how, mu how much a people can take. Now, the, the story with Sweden is, is fascinating because it turns out the frankest issue I've been discussing, it turns out that the Swedish royal court was penetrated in the uh, 18th century. So this might explain why Sweden is so absurdly left-wing, and they've been absurdly left-wing for uh, decades now. And uh, I, I don't know how they're going to do it. They just, the population just can't wake up. Now, in, in Israel in the 90s, we had a similar situation where there, there was a belief that there could be peace with the uh, Muslims. Oh, no, and I, I just, sorry to interrupt, but the, um, the leader of the Labour Party, uh, you would know, I've forgotten his name, he, uh, I think it could have been uh, Rabin. He, yes. he famous, Yitzhak Rabin, famously said that he wanted Israel to join the Arab League. Yeah, th this is an absurdity. 
Uh, they, unfortunately, it's a terrible situation, but there will never be peace between Israel and the Palestinians. You can just build a giant wall. Uh, the, the reason for this is, is if you actually go there, uh, there are two things that uh, jump out. Well, there are three things that uh, jump out at you. First, the highlands surrounding Israel are where the Palestinians live. They have a tactical advantage from where they can shoot down on you. Uh, the second is uh, there are crusader forts all over the place. And you remember Saladin, who is the hero of the Arab world, probably the greatest Arab to live in the last not, thousand not, years. Not an Arab. He was a Kurd. Well, he's still, he, they still, yeah, he was a Kurd. They still, he's associated with their victory. So they're living there in his area of his uh, success. So they st even though he's not an Arab, they uh, associate with him. And they think this is the place where we can defeat the uh, Crusaders. And th the third reason, the third problem is that, well, there, there actually is four problems. The third problem is that that's the homeland of the Christian and Jewish faith. If you can conquer Israel, you can establish a level of uh, dominion over the two rival faiths of uh, Islam. Make it much easier if they want to, if they want to spread their faith and bring converts in. So in places like uh, Africa, where there, there's warring going on between Jew, between Christians and Muslims, you can say, hey, you know, we control the uh, Holy Land. It makes the case for staying Christian much weaker. And the fourth problem is that they're very poor. So all of the, uh, the money in the Arab world pours in to fund war against um, Israel. So there's, there's no, nothing really to do in the West Bank other than war. That's their full-time hobby for 70 years. Well, I'm rather curious as to Saudi Arabia uh, funds these uh, Wahhabist madrasas all yes. over the world, which are known to be uh, a source of uh, terrorism and an inspiration for terrorism. And yet we're all agreed that the Saudis are, um, you know, they're our close allies. Uh, what do you make of this? Well, the truth of the matter is that um, Islam is going to be at war with someone. Better they be fighting the Shiite Sunni divide. This was what happened in the 80s. In the 80s, things were kind of quiet, and it was because there was a massive war between the Sunnis and Shiites. And the uh, Byzantines survived for about a thousand years versus Islam by playing on the Sunni Shiite divide. So, what we need to do is pursue a policy to make sure that the Sunnis and the Shiites are worried about each other and not worried about us. Well, wouldn't it make sense then uh, for the United States to seek some sort of rapprochement with uh, Iran? Well, we have to decide if we're going to be on the side of the Sunnis or the Shiites. That's the question. Who, who are we going to support? But we, ha we definitely have to make sure that they don't get along. If they all got along and sh shook hands, we'd be in huge trouble. Uh, Israel, for one, would be in a terrible situation. Right now, Israel is siding with the Sunnis, and the Sunni Sunnis hate the Shiites. So this is creating a measure of stability for the West. God knows how much worse it would be if we didn't have this conflict. I wanted to, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the alt-right itself. Now, the alt-right was riding high uh, up to the time of Trump's election. But it seems to me since that time, a lot of the bloom has gone off the rose. That uh, we've had these various uh, scandals or embarrassments, Roman salutes, and the rise of, I don't know, I suppose you could call them huckster figures within the movement. Yeah. Do you really think that the alt-right is still uh, a force? From the standpoint of this threat of multiculturalism, I may not like Richard Spencer, but he's on the right side of that issue. And he may not be the best possible leader. And the problem is their ideas are based on Kevin McDonald, which as I've expressed, has some flaws in, in his thinking. So from, they have a lot of problems with, with the alt-right, but we do need a far right counter to multiculturalism. That's the whole issue is that it doesn't exist. That's how Europe is being run over. That's how the West is being run over. We don't have a theological, a cultural, there's nothing to prepare us for this multicultural assault. And it's been staggeringly effective. Well, I'll just, so, I'll just mention that uh, my position is the same as Thomas Fleming's, who uh, 
had his problem with organized uh, Jewry, but said, you know, what people on the right don't seem to understand is if all the uh, Jews in the West uh, disappeared tomorrow, we'd still face exactly the same problem from liberalism. Yeah, the, the, the issue is this weird uh, Frankist pause, the a whole uh, panoply of these left-wing issues. And unfortunately, what Jews did in the 19th century and the uh, early 20th century is they, they breached the wall of Western civilization and they got inside. And then now it's spread among all levels. So you have white people in Sweden adopting uh, views of subversive Jewish intellectuals of 1890. So at this point, if let's say you threw all the, you brought in a spaceship and you sent the Jews to Mars, it wouldn't make any difference. We would still be in our terrible situation. What's needed, I, I believe, is actually to, to do the opposite, is to study how Israel defeated their internal left. And it's a combination of a little bit of nationalism, ethnic nationalism, nationalism, and a, uh, a religious structure. And that's, you need to combat all the different angles that cultural Marxists are using to take down your uh, uh, society. And the alt-right in Richard Spencer, he's at least covering one attack vector, which is trying to overrun our country with foreigners, hostile foreigners. Well, are you an admirer of Avigdor Lieberman? Uh, which one is he? He's a defense minister. He's a, Israel's yes. defense minister. Okay, yeah. And he is, I mean, he's the most extreme polarizer in Israel. Yeah, I, I've read about him vaguely. I there I don't really know his, his policy uh, specifically. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, there's no, uh, you know, this, uh, I don't know. Israel still pays lip service to this idea of the peace process and... I suppose I understand why they do it, but as you said earlier, I mean, assuming there was some sort of Palestinian state, however that was constituted, it seems glaringly obvious to me that it would be used as a base from which to try to destroy Israel. So I don't know why they bother with it. But uh, getting back to the alt-right, what do you see the alt-right is accomplishing and how would it accomplish that? Well, what, what I hope they do is drop some of the Jewish monomania. That may have gotten them started because what they did is by hitting the Jewish issue, they created kind of tasty, sexy content that couldn't be uh, provided by a uh, national review. They established themselves as edgy. But at this point, it's probably wearing thin and they have to construct a more serious counter to the left other than just the race issue. No, I agree. I, I mean, I just wish that there were a middle position between Jews are the best, I wish I were a Jew, and autistic screeching Nazi division. What I've done is actually laid out that specific spot where there, there is, there, Jews do wonderful things, but unfortunately, there's a definitely a very toxic intellectual element in Judaism that's dangerous. And if you can understand that, you can get a much better handle on the left and what's going on in, in the West in general. Well, Rebbe, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Okay, thank you.